passing by. My name is Krista and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Costco Wholesale Corporation third quarter 2024 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question at that time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. And if you'd like to withdraw that question, again, press star one. Thank you. I will now turn the conference over to Gary Millerchip, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Gary, you may begin your conference. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the call today. I'd like to start by saying how excited I am to be part of the Costco team. And it's a pleasure to be hosting my first Costco quarterly conference call. The whole Costco team has been incredibly welcoming. And as you might imagine, my first three months working alongside Richard have been a lot of fun. It's also been great visiting warehouses and facilities to immerse myself in the Costco culture and experience firsthand how this is positioning the company for continued growth. Over recent months, I've spent time and met with many analysts and investors, several of whom I know through my prior role. And it's clear you value and appreciate the company's current approach to investor communications. While I can't promise to be able to match the humor that Richard Galante has become famous for, I can promise the same level of open dialogue and transparency you've come to expect. Oh, and to clear up some recent media speculation, I also want to confirm the $1.50 hot dog price is safe. Before I talk about our results, I wanted to mention that Ron Vacras is also joined today's call. Many of you have expressed interest in hearing from Ron, and so we thought it would be a good idea to have Ron join the discussion, and he can also take a few questions. Ron, would you like to add anything before we talk about the quarter? Thank you, Gary, and again, welcome to Costco. I'm very happy to report that the transition from Richard to Gary has gone very well, and we're very excited to have Gary on board as part of Costco, and I look forward to working together on the growth opportunities ahead for our company. Before we jump into the quarter, I wanted to make a couple of comments on the leadership transition. As Richard has mentioned on previous calls, i would worked closely with Craig Gentley for many years, including side-by-side -side for the last two years as president. And so the tra CEO transition has been a very seamless process. Since January, my time has been focused on working closely with the teams around the world to ensure we continue to deliver the best quality merchandise at a best value for our members. I'm incredibly proud of our employees and I believe our consistency of the results is a reflection of their commitment to our members and to each other. Consistent with how Craig and Richard manage investor communications, I intend to have Gary host the quarterly conference calls, and I will join as business permits to answer a few questions. So Gary, let's go to the results, and I'm happy to jump back in for the Q&A portion to field some questions today. Thanks, Ron. I'll start by stating that these discussions will include forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These statements involve risks and uncertainties that may cause actual events, results, and or performance to differ materially from those indicated by such statements. The risks and uncertainties include, but are not limited to, those outlined in today's call, as well as other risks identified from time to time in the company's public statements and reports filed with the SEC. Forward-looking statements speak only as of the date they are made, and the company does not undertake to update these statements except as required by law. Comparable sales and comparable sales excluding impacts from changes in gasoline prices and foreign exchange are intended as supplemental information and are not a substitute for net sales presented in accordance with GAAP. In today's press release, we reported operating results for the third quarter of fiscal 24. The 12 weeks ended May 12. Before I walk through all the numbers, new for this quarter, we are making available a slide presentation on our investor site under events and presentations. These slides summarize much of the information I will share today, including Richard's famous matrices. We intend to make this information available every quarter. Reported net income for the third quarter came in at $1.68 billion, or $3.78 per diluted share, up from $1.3 billion and $2.93 per diluted share in the third quarter last year. 
Last year's results included a non-recurring charge to merchandise costs of $298 million pre-tax, or 50 cents per diluted share, primarily for the discontinuation of our charter shipping activities. Net sales for the third quarter were $57.39 billion, an increase of 9.1% from $52.6 billion in the third quarter last year. The following comparable sales reflect comparable locations year over year and comparable retail weeks. US comp sales were 6.2% or 6% adjusted for gas inflation and FX. Canada was 7.7% or 7.4% adjusted. Other international was 7.7% or 8.5% adjusted, and this led to total company comp sales of 6.6% or 6.5% adjusted for gas inflation and FX. Finally, e-commerce comp sales were 20.7%, both on a reported basis and adjusted for foreign exchange. In terms of Q3 comp sales metrics, traffic or shopping frequency increased 6.1% worldwide and 5.5% in the US. Our average transaction or ticket was up 0.5% worldwide and up 0.7% in the US. Foreign currencies relative to the US dollar negatively impacted sales by approximately 20 basis points, while gasoline price inflation positively impacted sales by approximately 30 basis points. Moving down the income statement to membership fee income. We reported membership fee income of $1,123,000,000, an increase of $79,000,000 or 7.6% year over year. Membership fee income growth was 8% excluding FX. In terms of renewal rates, at Q3 end, our US and Canada renewal rate was 93%, up one tenth of a percent from Q2 end. The worldwide rate came in at 90.5%, the same as Q2 end. We ended Q3 with 74.5 million paid household members, up 7.8% versus last year, and 133.9 million cardholders, up 7.4% year over year. At Q3 end, we had 34.5 million paid executive memberships, an increase of 661,000 since Q2 end. Executive members now represent over 46% of paid members and 73.1% of worldwide sales. Our reported gross margin rate in the third quarter was higher year over year by 52 basis points, coming in at 10.84% compared to 10.32% last year and up 54 basis points excluding gas inflation. Core was flat and higher by two basis points without gas inflation. In terms of core margin on their own sales, our core on core margins were higher by 10 basis points. Ancillary and other businesses gross margin was lower six basis points and lower five basis points excluding gas inflation. This decrease year over year was driven by gas, partially offset by e-commerce. 2% reward was lower by one basis point both with and without gas inflation, with higher sales penetration coming from our executive members. LIFO was a benefit of two basis points. We had an $11 million LIFO credit in Q3 this year, compared to no LIFO charge or credit in Q3 last year. This is the third LIFO credit this year, following a $15 million LIFO credit in Q1 and a $14 million credit in Q2. And finally, other was higher 57 basis points or 56 basis points excluding gas inflation. This was all related to lapping last year's negative impact from the $298 million pre-tax charge for charter shipping activities. Moving on to SG&A. Our reported SG&A rate in the third quarter was lower or better year over year by 15 basis points, coming in this year at 8.96% compared to last year's 9.11%. SG&A was lower year over year by 12 basis points adjusted for gas inflation. The operations components of SG&A was lower by 14 basis points and lower by 12 basis points, excluding the impact from gas inflation, despite an increase in warehouse wages this year. Higher labor productivity and great cost discipline by our operators drove the improved core SG&A results for the quarter. 
Central was better by one basis point and flat without gas inflation. And stock compensation and pre-opening were both flat year over year. Below the operating income line, interest expense was $41 million this year versus $36 million last year. And interest income and other for the quarter was flat year over year as lower interest income was offset by a foreign exchange gain in the quarter. In terms of income taxes, our tax rate in Q3 was 26.4% compared to 26.5% in Q3 last year. Overall, reported net income was up 29.1% year over year, and excluding last year's charge related to the discontinuation of charter shipping activities, it was up 10.3% year over year. A few other items of note. In terms of warehouse expansion, in the third quarter, we opened two new warehouses, both in the US. Additionally, since the end of Q3, we had two more openings. Last week, we opened in Loomis, California, and two days ago, we opened our seventh building in China in the Nanjing market. For the remainder of fiscal 24, we plan to open another 12 new locations, nine in the US, two in Japan, and one in Korea. This would bring the total for the full year to 30 openings, including one relocation for a net of 29 new warehouses. Regarding capital expenditures, Q3 spend was approximately $1.06 billion, and we estimate full year 24 capital expenditure will be between $4.3 and $4.5 billion. Diving a bit deeper into some of the key themes we saw during the quarter, Non-foods had the highest comps of our core categories. This strength was aided by lapping some softness in sales a year ago, but was really driven by our merchandising teams doing a great job identifying high quality items with values that really resonated with our members and buying those items with conviction. As inflation has leveled off, our members are returning to purchasing more discretionary items. And growth in the category was led by toys, tires, lawn and garden, and health and beauty aids. Bakery sales also showed great momentum in the quarter, as our fresh foods team has reinvented that department with a number of new and exciting items, including the curtain signature lemon blueberry loaf and morning buns. Within our ancillary businesses, the food court had the strongest quarterly sales, with continued success of the chocolate chip cookie that was added to the food court this year. On the inflation front, it's more of the same from last quarter. Across all core merchandise, inflation was essentially flat in Q3, with fresh foods close to zero and slight inflation in food and sundries being offset by some deflation in non-foods. The deflation in non-foods was led by hardware, sporting goods, and furniture, all still benefiting from lower freight costs year over year. Keep in mind that when we speak to inflation, or in the case of non-foods deflation, we're referring to our selling prices. We're intentionally creating incremental value for our members by delivering lower prices wherever possible. We believe our strategy of delivering value to drive unit volume and member satisfaction is the winning combination for us. In that vein, our buying teams are constantly aware of changing costs across all of their SKUs and are ensuring that we're capturing all cost decreases quickly so that we can pass on incremental value through price reductions. If we are unsuccessful in delivering ultimate value with branded goods, we evaluate the potential for new high quality Kirkland signature items with a goal of providing at least 20% value versus what we would sell the national brand item at. This quarter, we released a new Kirkland signature men's walking shoe and new Kirkland signature facial wipes, both of which are doing very well. We also reduced prices on a number of existing items, including lowering Kirkland Signature pine nuts from $29.99 to $24.99, and reducing the price of our Kirkland Signature frozen shrimp skews by $1. These are just a couple of examples that came out of our recent monthly budget meetings, where each country and region shares new and exciting items they have introduced to their warehouses and items where they've lowered prices. Turning now to digital, we continue to make enhancements to the app and website and are excited about the traction that these initiatives are getting with members. 
Total e-commerce sales growth in the quarter was led by gold and silver bullion, gift cards, and appliances. In appliances, Costco Logistics is playing a key role in providing both greater value and a better end-to-end -end experience for members. Deliveries through Costco Logistics were up 28% in the quarter. Costco Next, our curated marketplace, also continues to grow nicely, and we added eight new vendors in Q3, bringing the total to 75. Our app downloads were up 32% versus a year ago, with about 2.5 million new downloads in the quarter, bringing total downloads to more than 35 million. Site traffic was up 16%, and average order value was up 8%. You may have also recently seen an announcement that we are expanding our relationship with Uber. Previously, Uber Eats delivered Costco orders in Texas, and this new agreement allows consumers the ability to order from Costco through Uber Eats across all of Canada, as well as 17 states in the US. We are also working to expand this partnership to several of our international countries in the coming months. In addition to the increased access to Uber Eats customers, the agreement will allow us to sell Uber gift cards globally and offer discounted Uber One annual membership to Costco members. Finally, in terms of our upcoming releases, we will announce our May sales results for the four weeks ending Sunday, June the 2nd on Wednesday, June the 5th after market close. Also, remember that our fiscal fourth quarter ending September 1, 2024 will have 16 weeks versus the 17 weeks in the fiscal fourth quarter last year. And with that, we will now open it up for Q&A. Thanks. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad to raise your hand and join the queue. If you would like to withdraw your question, again press star 1. And please limit yourself to one question and a single follow-up. Your first question comes from the line of Simeon Gutman with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Hey, Gary. How you doing? Um, Hi, Simeon. We're going to take a stab at um, this membership question. The way that we, we've, we've thought about it is it's an inflation offset to the model, and it was described as if you have enough levers in the middle of the P&L to deliver whatever stated EBIT growth you're trying to do, you didn't need to touch the membership fee. Is that still the way that you look at it, and is that visibility on enough levers still intact? Yeah, thanks, Simeon. Uh, and you're talking about a membership fee increase now? Is that where you're... Question Correct. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I would really kind of revert back to some of the comments that Richard shared previously. I don't think that we're thinking about it any differently than, than he's talked about in the last few calls. You know, we've historically uh, looked at increasing the membership fee every five years or so. And um, obviously, we're beyond that time period now in terms of what would be the typical cycle. Um, there's nothing about anything that we see within how the business is performing that's changing our view on that. We feel really good about membership renewal rates, we feel really good about the test of are we delivering significantly more value to members than we were uh, or have since we last increased the membership fee. Um, but I think we are our own probably toughest competitor in that we look at what's happened in the, the marketplace over the last few years and when we were seeing high inflation and uh, the risk and concern around recession, um, you know, we, as I, I know before I joined the company it was talked about extensively and it, it continues to be talked about as it's something that it's still a case of when we increase the fee rather than if we increase the fee. Um, but we're still evaluating those, uh, those considerations to determine what the right timing is. And when we reach that point where we feel it is the right time, of course, we'll be very open and direct in communicating that. Okay, fair enough. Um, can I ask about your opinion on the U.S. expansion? It's been holding in a lot better. It's been more giving than we would have thought several years ago. Do you have any thoughts, just your own perspective? You're probably looking at members per warehouse. Are you surprised at the runway you still have in the U.S.? Do you think it could be even you know, more than what we're aware of today, less? Just curious if there's anything surprising on that, on that item. Um, I think it's, it's only surprising in as much as uh, I know we've talked previously about we thought that we would potentially run out of runway for new warehouses in the U.S. And as you know, this year we're opening – uh, close to 29 net new warehouses, and uh, many of those will be uh, continuing in the U.S., and we still see significant runway to continue to opening more warehouses in the U.S. in the future. Uh, you know, I think that sort of 25 to 30 
new warehouse count is a, is a reasonable proxy for what we think the runway is for the foreseeable future for new warehouses. And I'd be surprised if at least half of those weren't in the continue to be in the U.S. because we we still see significant growth when we open those new warehouses. And what it's doing for us in fill-in markets is it's creating capacity for our members that are shopping very busy warehouses today to be able to um, shop more frequently and drive more more engagement with us. And also it increases membership renewal rates over time as well. So I think we still see plenty of runway in the U.S. to continue to open more warehouses. Um, but we also see a lot of growth opportunity, of course, in the international markets as well. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Of course. Thanks, Amir. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Lasser with UBS. Please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking my question. There's been a lot of announcements from consumable retailers in recent times about making price investments. Do you think you need to make a sizable price investment in the next couple of quarters in order to remain competitive? This is Ron Backers. <clears throat> no, I, you know, I think that this is part of our everyday DNA. I mean, we are competitive on a daily basis. Um, our buyers are on top of pricing daily, weekly, and we all review them each month. And so we feel very good about where we are today and uh, our runway to continue to be as competitive as we are moving forward. My follow-up question is, given some of the changes in, in leadership over the last uh, year or so, are, is there any thought given to being more aggressive with some of the evolution on, uh, on the model, things like buy online, pick up in store, deploying more um, technology in the store, or capitalizing on the ever so uh, great amounts of data that Costco has uh, in the form of trying to monetize it through retail media. Thank you very much. That's no, and I think the answer to that is yes on all those fronts. Um, we we are working on all those aspects right now. We're we're rolling out um, an expanded buy online pickup and warehouse that is always going to be limited in scope based on the volume in our warehouses that we have, we can't expand to all categories, but we're expanding as we currently speak on televisions and other electronic items that are there. As, and so, yeah, we see that as a, as a real opportunity for us. Technology is going to be one of our key priorities moving forward. How do we improve that member engagement and the, the relationship we have with them in our brick and mortar warehouses as well as online and through other aspects such as, as travel and so forth. So. Um, technology we see is a great opportunity to enhance the member relationship with Costco and also drive a lot more business for us as well as we move forward. So we're going to continually innovate. I mean, uh, you know, with the management changes, I wouldn't expect major changes as we have a proven strategy now. But as we've done for the past 41 years, we continue to innovate to the needs of our members. Oh, and, and uh, the last on, on data. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, we see a great opportunity for our data. We have expanded our group there. We, um, we have a, a significant program now with retail media, and, um, and we see some great upside potential. We've expanded that team, and we see some, some good potential and some good runway for us in that as well, things like personalization and so forth. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Your next question comes from the line of Chuck Grom with Gordon Haskett. Please go ahead. Hey, um, good afternoon, and congrats again, Gary. Um, you know, historically, Richard and team have been uh, steadfast on the 14 to 15 percent margin ceiling, which has clearly you know paid div dividends for the company over the years. I'm curious about how you and Ron view this thresh threshold. Are you going to adhere to it? Do you think you're going to earn more? Just your thoughts on the margin front. No, with that uh, that 14, 15 percent has been part of our life for many years, and and uh, you know, so I think I, that's our, our objective, our buyers' goals is really how aggressive they can get on pricing and and deliver the best value. So I don't see um, there's no plans to move that cap at all. And Chuck, maybe just one thing to build on that too. I think as, as you think about some of the opportunities that Ron mentioned on the earlier call, I, I, I completely echoes Ron's comment about we have a really clear growth strategy that's obviously. Uh, delivering momentum in the company today and these opportunities through technology and media 
I think are, are great opportunities for us to find new ways to unlock value. But but again, I think we see those very much in the mindset of how do we give 90%-ish of that back to the member so that we're continuing to drive member engagement, member loyalty, and member value. Okay, great. <clears throat> and then just to kind of build off uh, Michael's question, just just wanted to get your high-level thoughts on, on digital e-com. You know, what do you think Costco's strengths are? What do you think the weaknesses are today? And, and, and where do you think the biggest focus is going to be for, for the company in, in the coming years? You know, our biggest strength on, on digital e-com is, of course, the merchandise and the value that we have. I mean, that's, that's what works for us in our brick and mortar. Um, you know, the technology, the systems that we have, um, the, you know, the teams have got a great roadmap of where they're going. A lot of the work that's being done right now is very foundational. Um, so, you know, better fulfillment, quicker delivery times, um, you know, uh, reliability of the site, those type of things. So that those are the things. And then following that will come iterative changes of forward-facing improvements that you'll see on the sites and, and move forward. So I think we've got a very good roadmap um, to do that. But I think that does, it's, I think personalization um, is a big deal for members that we could do a much better job on and also a, a, a better correlation of the warehouse and the online business. Um, you know, we're working towards warehouse inventory online, so members could use that in the app. But app functionality is one of our greatest opportunities. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. You know, your next question comes from the line of Scott Secorelli with Truist Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, guys. Scott Secorelli. So given the strength of your discretionary sales following the level that we've seen with uh, as the economy got a little funky, does that suggest uh, your members are starting to feel better and more willing to spend on wants rather than needs? You, you know, it, it, it does indeed look that way. I've got to tell you that uh, the discretionary spend we're seeing, I mean, we're, we're definitely winning in consumables as we see the food business and, you know, dining away from home is, is is softened up a bit and people are eating and we're seeing that in our fresh foods. But I have to tell you that categories such as the home division and toys are categories that have lagged quite a bit post COVID that with great excitement, I mean, our buyers have come out and delivered some great items have phenomenal values have really rejuvenated those categories. And those are both leading categories for us in sporting goods, toys, um, you know, furnishings, uh, domestics, all those categories are really coming on very strong now and all of a discretionary nature. Fascinating. And then today we had a presentation. Obviously, Ron, you joined the call. Are there other changes we could potentially expect given some of the C-suite changes? I mean, again, like I said, uh, you know, there's, there's no major changes planned. Um, the team is the team that's been running this company for some time. Gary has been a great addition to us and uh, is, is contributing nicely. But, you know, our, our model is working. Um, it's working around the world. Um, great value on quality merchandise seems to resonate in every region that we do business. So we'll continue to innovate. We'll continue to see new things and, and be relative to what our members' needs are. But I can't sit here today and tell you to expect anything, any great momentous changes in the near future. We just want to continue Very to excellent, execute well. And Scott, maybe just to add from, from my perspective of being new, new to the role and new sure. to the company, you know, early observations for me, obviously the incredibly um, – impressed with the, the culture and the strategy is clearly working very well. So my first priority is to really, it being new to the company, is to really acclimatize and to, to support and enable a smooth transition with the culture to make sure the momentum that we have continues going forward. And I think the other point, is, as we talked about a little bit earlier on the call, is we're on a journey with technology and data. And so hopefully there's things that I can bring to work with the team and help us continuing on that journey and accelerate that journey. And, and really that's the, the priorities in, in my mind being new into the CFO role. Very helpful. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Kelly Banya with BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Thanks for uh, taking our questions, and, and Ron and Gary, pleasure to have you both on the call, uh, and love the slides. Thank you. Um, wanted to just maybe go back a little bit um, to retail media strategy and, and personalization. I think Ron, you noted a hire or maybe some key hires in that department. Um, and Gary, I think you bring a unique perspective to this area or both of these areas. So I guess 
just can you help size up the opportunity for us um, on these two fronts in retail media and personalization? Is it at all different um, than a typical retailer because of Costco's unique model and, and, and SKU count or, or anything um, along those lines? And I guess would that would, would your plans in these areas um, include any increase in technology spend in coming years? Sure, thanks, Kelly. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first, and then Ron may want to add some color as well. Um, you know, I, I think um, many of your comments are, are relevant to how we think about the opportunity. Um, you know, from the first thing I guess I would say as being new and having joined the company is as you think about where a lot of companies talk about alternative profit streams, there are a lot of areas today where Costco is doing great things in that area today. So using the, the strength of the membership relationship in driving a very large uh, co-brand payment program that delivers value to members and delivers values to the company. The, the travel services business that we have, which is pretty unique in retail, but I think in any other company would be viewed as a, a way of generating new revenue and alternative revenue streams from sort of expanding from that overall retail relationship. And then thirdly, I would say we have media revenue today in, in areas of the business. So it's not as though it, it isn't something that actually the business is delivering on today. But I think as, as Ron mentioned in an earlier comment that as technology and data are something that we're sort of building a path towards, I would still say there's significant opportunity for us to grow in that space because of the unique nature of the relationship we have with our members and the, the, the ways in which we can deliver value for them and tap into that uh, that data and tap into the growth that we're creating both in the warehouse and through digital channels. I think it's a little bit early to sort of size it in totality because you're right, there are also some unique elements about our model that, that would make our opportunity a little bit different. But from what we know today and from the team that's been brought in to help the company think through it, we certainly believe it's got significant runway to drive a lot of growth for the company. And as I mentioned earlier, though, I, I would definitely think of it as something that we'll look at to, as we do with everything, reinvest in the member to really accelerate the growth of the company overall. I, I would have to mirror what Gary says. We are we do have a unique model. We have a, a relationship with all of our members. Um, our responsibility is use that data wisely and, and respectfully. Um, as far as IT spend, yeah, there will be some IT spend. Um, we don't see, as we look in the future, we don't see that to be anything that will really change our trajectory of our CAP investments, but um, there will be some IT requirements, but we feel that, that will be in the normal course of business. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Your next question comes from the line of John Heimbockel with Google Heim Guggenheim Securities. Please go ahead. So guys, I want to go, want to go back to personalization again. Um, where, where do you think just conceptually the biggest opportunities are, right? Because when you think about wallet share, you know, every, every one of your members is going to be a little different, but you can probably do cohorts. Um, you know, what, where are they not buying from you and why? Uh, you know, personalized promotions, outreach on, on new items coming into the warehouse. I mean, where, where do you think the, the, um, the biggest opportunities are to, to build further wallet share? Uh, John, I'll, I'll go ahead and start out. I think the biggest opportunity is, just like you said, the, the awareness of, uh, of the warehouse and, and keeping our members in tune on what's, what's active, what's going on in the warehouse near them, and how we can continue to enhance and drive those sales. I think that that's probably our greatest opportunity with digital as we see moving forward. Um, you know, personalization is good. We, we talk here a lot about a, a, a fair, reasonable amount of personalization. We never want to compromise the treasure hunt of Costco. And, and that's, that's equally as important as people that go to Costco.com never knew that they needed a 16-foot a, a shed. And uh, they see a phenomenal value, as they do in the warehouse. And uh, so we don't want to personalize to a detriment, uh, you know, that, that changes our DNA and who we are. But we do know that there's definitely some improvements we could have that would enhance the member experience. And that's everything that our team is focused on is that how does this move to the member and how does it improve their experience with us digitally? Okay, maybe, and then as a follow-up, Gary, you, know, you, you, you talked a little bit about the core on core. But maybe you step back a little bit if you, and I, and I know um, the idea is not necessarily to maximize margin, but, you know, maybe some thoughts um, core on core this quarter. And, and I know, I, I think there had been pressure on fresh, right, as you kind of normalized post-COVID, uh, you know, back to a, a regular level. Are we, are we now through that process of, of fresh 
uh, getting back down to a certain level. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, just maybe to give you a little bit more color on the core on core, um, how, how it kind of uh, looked, played out during the quarter. Um, so if you think about the three main categories in core between foods and sundries, fresh and non-foods, uh, fresh would have continued to been uh, slightly lower uh, year over year. And that's a very deliberate strategy uh, for us to make sure we're delivering more value for the member. And we think that's a really important place for us to drive member engagement and, and support, especially as we're still seeing some commodities that are a little bit inflationary right now. So that would have been uh, very much uh, a part of the plan from our perspective. Um, but it was more than offset, as, as you mentioned, by the improvement in non-foods during the quarter, which was what led to the 10 basis point improvement on core on core. Food and sundry actually was, was pretty flat overall. So we, we feel good about the way that we're managing the balance while staying true to that principle of delivering the best value for the member. And uh, we, were, we were pleased with how, uh, how it played out during the quarter based on the, the work all the merchandising teams did. Thank you. Thanks, John. Your next question comes from the line of Peter Benedict with Baird. Please go ahead. Peter, if you're on mute. Sorry about okay. that. Um, yeah, sorry about that, guys. Uh, yeah, thanks for taking the question. Ron, maybe, maybe one for you, just kind of back to the member behavior, maybe back to Scott's question a little bit. Can you just talk about maybe just your observations um, around maybe income cohorts, any other ways you, you bucket or slice your membership base, just how the behaviors have evolved here over the last several months. Um, is there any change that you, you, you think is interesting to call out? You talked about the better general uh, non-foods trends. Just curious if this environment reminds you of, of, of anything else historically. Uh, that's my first question. Okay, you know, uh, it's, it's a, a very healthy environment from what we see from our members right now. And, and as you take a category such as our meat department, which is growing very nicely, um, a lot of volume being driven in ground beef and our new everyday lower price on boneless, skinless chicken breasts, um, really driving a lot of volume units there, while Wagyu beef and prime are growing at, at a great clip for us as well. So we're seeing that benefit um, from both sides of the consumer that great value in, in both areas are doing very well. The non-foods, I, I tell you that non-foods is strictly driven by newness and excitement. And, and uh, you know, we, we see big and bulky going very well. It's been a year of, of our $1,200 swing set that we have on the floor. We can't get enough. They're just blowing out. But it's, it's again, that continuous innovation of merchandise that is, is exciting our members and really driving some sales for us there. Executive membership Very continues well. to, yeah, and that drives our executive base, and because people are engaging at a much higher level. Right, good. So, so sounds good across the board. Well, we're we're expecting a dryer to get delivered from uh, Costco Logistics on uh, uh, in the next couple of days. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, and then the second question would be, yeah, Ron or, or Gary, either one of you, just just your view on on vertical sourcing. I mean, this has been something that Costco has been involved in for uh, for several years going across different categories as you guys continue to grow your business, you need, uh, you know, more, uh, I guess, definable sources of supply. Just curious your view of, of vertical sourcing, where you are today, uh, and what, uh, what areas you might focus on over the next uh, several years. Thank you. Sure. You know, we have, we've gotten into vertical integration and sourcing um, as the need arises. And, and if you think back in the, the, the infamous story about the hot dog and Coke at $1.50, and how are you going to figure out how to keep that price there? Well, we're going to open our own meat plants. And as we looked at the prices of, of optical lenses going up, and then we opened up our optical grinding plants. So we did that to continue to look at those things. Um, the chicken plant came because we saw an inflection point where supply was not going to meet demand. So we had to get involved, and because we didn't have a partner that was willing to expand into that area as well. There is, a, there is a focus that I have the group focused on, too, is that let's not try and be everything, though. Let's, uh, we've, got, we've got a business to run here, and we're not going to get vertically integrated just because it's something we can do. Um, it, it really is going to be driven by where the needs are and when do you need to step in. Um, it's equally, we have great partners out there that supply our goods for us, and they're, they're long-term suppliers. And so it's, uh, you know, strategically using that relationship is going to be the key in the future. 
So there's nothing that I could announce at this time that we're going to expand into, but we continue to keep that in our back pocket should we need to. Terrific. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Your next question comes from the line of Paul Lejas with Citigroup. Please go ahead. Hey, everyone. This is Brandon Cheatham on for Paul. Uh, thanks for taking our question. Um, recently, you were selling in Instacart gift cards at a discount online and in warehouse. And I thought that was pretty interesting because it's potentially a gift card that could be used at a competitor as well. So I'm, I'm just curious, you know, is there any strategy behind that? Um, are you trying to drive member engagement online? Is there any learnings from uh, that initiative? Um, you know, the, the, the strategy behind it was another avenue to bring value to our members is really what that was about, is that, you know, there is an upcharge on having grocery delivered to home. Um, you know, we work closely with Instacart, and now we will with Uber to try and keep those costs at a minimum, but, um, you know, they've got people to pay on their side as well. So the partnership was really to, you know, how do we continue to enhance that, that service for our members and um, drive more sales? And so, you know, that was truly the, yeah, somebody can go out and use that somewhere else. But again, um, our job is to save the members where we can and uh, be it airline tickets or, you know, Uber drive tickets or Instacart shopping. Um, we look at all those opportunities to add value to the member. Got it. Thanks. And my follow-up, um, how do you warehouses react when you open an infill warehouse? You know, does it open differently than um, other new markets? Does the current market feel an impact? And how many warehouses that you opened over the past year would you quantify as infill versus well, new market thing? Uh, I I guess how how they react, um, you know, we we normally have good data before we'll open up an infill building, and we can we can judge based on our member information what cannibalization we'll realize in what building. So we're able to get in front of that and adjust labor and payroll and buying and all those type of things for the upcoming cannibalization that we plan. And our team does a very good job. They're normally within within a percent or so of what it, reality is to to the execution of what our plans are as well. So we, we've gotten pretty good at planning those those things out. And, um, you know, we, we, it's, it's uh, strategic. And the number of cannibalized locations, I'd have to tell you, I'd have to say that we probably opened uh, eight this year that cannibalized other buildings. Some may have cannibalized one warehouse. Others may be in the middle. Um, we had one in Toronto that cannibalized four buildings. Um, around it, but um, they've built back their sales within six months. So those are the opportunities where you know, to Gary's earlier point, frequency improves significantly because members can get back into a high volume club. And so it's it's strategic cannibalization, if you would, as we look around the world. Very helpful. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Greg Millich with Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, Ron, I wanted to follow up on the, the gross margin uh, cap still very much in place at 14, 15%. Is there any reason that SGNA, now that it's back under 9% of sales, couldn't fall to 8 if you keep having the, the growth that you have? No, that's a very fair, that's a very good point. No, we we continue to see, I mean, the, the company, we had a very healthy SG&A number this quarter. Um, you know, inventory was flowing very well. We had fresh goods coming through the system. Um, our warehouses did a phenomenal job. SKU counts are in line. Um, and so it's one of those things where all the stars aligned. And uh, this is the way we operate well. When you can deliver that kind of a top-line growth at, at our size now, our operators do a tremendous job leveraging that to the SGNA. So, I, you know, what could that could that get to? I'd hate to say eight percent, but I do think that we can have continued runway of of driving down that number. Uh, that's great to hear. And on um, maybe some insight on gas gallons in the quarter. I know it was volatile, and there's certainly a, a point of pressure for a lot of members and consumers. Did that help the the traffic acceleration in the quarter? Gas gallon growth. Yeah, we were we were uh, five percent up in gallons, um, you know, and and again, that's that's I think all those things when you can save people, 
um, on gas that's also going to lend to your traffic as well. But gallons were up 5% for the quarter. A great number. And if I could follow up on gas, uh, is that still, is the profitability in gas, Gary, kind of similar versus a year ago or last quarter? Or is that trending up or down? Yeah, the, the gas profitability would, be, would have been down a little bit. I think you, you may have heard me mention in the uh, prepared comments that uh, when we looked at the overall gross margin rate for the quarter, um, the, the, the sort of headwind that we had was in the ancillary businesses, the other businesses, and it was, it was essentially gas that created that headwind. So we did see um, a reduction in gas profitability during the quarter, but overall the core on core margin improvement and e-commerce improvement essentially offset that to bring us pretty, pretty close to flat overall when you adjust for, for gas inflation uh, in the results. So, so it was down. I would say general we've seen on gas profitability, it's been uh, you know, relatively consistent to slightly improving if you look over the last few years, but, um, uh, but obviously there are points in time when you think about volatility in fuel prices where you can have those ups or downs in any given quarter. And, and that was, this last quarter was one where we did see a, a headwind in year over year gas profitability. That's fantastic. Well, welcome, and I'll let somebody else ask about how much uh, gold bullion drove the comp. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Rupesh Parikh with Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. So just going back to unit growth, you know, in recent years, it's been stuck in that, let's call that mid-20s. It looks like this year will be closer to 30. Just wanted to get a sense of, you know, the opportunities to potentially accelerate that unit growth, especially in the U.S., just given some of your competitors are planning to accelerate growth from here. You know, it is a, it is a good business. When you look at, I talked before about uh, managed cannibalization and when you do these infills and, uh, you know, 29 locations is a solid number for us. As you start getting into infills, some of these projects take a little longer. You know, it's a little a little tougher than there's not a whole lot of um, green land out there for us to go in and open up a warehouse. So we have to do some creative things to, to find a way to infill in a very high market. Um, international expansion continues to be strong. Um, some of the countries or regions that we do um, business in take quite a bit longer to get things done. So I think you'll see that ebb and flow. Um, that, that number 25 to 29 is a, or 25 to 30 is a good number for us. We feel good with our staffing and leadership and building out the infrastructure behind these warehouses. So we open with great solid support there. Great. And then maybe just one follow-up question. So in turn, you know, so you guys added Uber uh, to a number of locations. So, you know, as, as you guys think about the intermediate to longer term, like would you expect multiple providers at all Costco U U.S. stores over time? So maybe just more the rationale in terms of adding Uber and uh, the longer term vision. You know, there, we, we saw, we were testing Uber for some time in Texas. We had a test going on there and we did see a new cohort of members engagement um, that, that are on the Uber platform. Um, Uber also allowed us to expand our international footprint too. So we're gonna be out in um, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, UK, um, that we'll be expanding and where we don't have grocery delivery now. So there were some real benefits to that relationship along with the long-standing Instacart relationship that we had has been very good for many years. So we think that it does open up a window for us for some new member engagement. And uh, we also think that it's gonna be very good for us internationally in expansion there as well. Great, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Christopher Horvers with JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. It's Christian Carlino on for Chris. Could you speak to some of the innovation you're seeing in non-foods and, and anything else you think is driving some of the, the performance, particularly in the discretionary categories? You know, you called out toys, sporting goods, and homes, so maybe any, any incremental color you can provide on those in particular. And while you're clearly gaining share, when you compare your own performance to some of the syndicated data out there, does the emerging newness suggest there's also somewhat of a rising tide in, in some of these categories that saw some pull forward over the pandemic? Thanks. Well, yeah, I think, you know, if you look at, if you talk about the home category, and definitely is furnishings, which is one that was quite soft post-pandemic, that has come back strong in furniture, um, those type of things. In home decor, um, it, it's been some very unique items. I mean, we've got uh, seven-foot um, artificial trees that, that have come in and just exploded out and just blowing out of the warehouses, and, and those are going at, at uh, a nice clip. Um, domestics, uh, you know, most unique items, Swedish dish towels, import items we're finding from around the world 
are doing very well. But it really comes down to unique items at great values that are that are exciting the members in all those categories. The housewares categories have been great. Um, you know, sporting goods and toys, inflatable outdoor toys have been a big, big category for us as well. Um, you know, we, we've added the, the Kirkland Signature Driver into our golf lineup. That that has uh, that sells out as quick as it goes online. So we're seeing uh, wins in several different categories. Got it. That's that's really helpful. And just broadly, are you seeing the competitive environment heat up in terms of peers investing in price, particularly in non-foods? Um, you have some peers talking more and more about looking to drive units. Others are talking about, you know, big step up in appliance promotions recently. So any color, any color on what you're seeing competitively? You know, there'll, there'll be ebbs and flows um, with the competition, but I'm very confident that we are always in the right position and we're staying ahead of that to keep the value there for our members. So that, that these are those things are cyclical, um, but we're going to be a value every day. And I think maybe just one thing to mention on that, Ron, too. You mentioned it earlier, but with the, on the appliances, uh, obviously making sure we're always very competitive on price. But I do think the uh, the acquisition of Innovel Costco Logistics now and the the value that we offer members there through both including the delivery and the insulation and the removal of uh, the old appliances is, is is proving to be a real differentiator for us on the member experience as well. Absolutely. Got it. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of Scott Mushkin with R5 Capital. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. And uh, Gary, welcome. It's nice to be talking to you at Costco. Um, thanks, and Ron, thanks for coming up. I appreciate it. You're so um, my, my, my first question um, is kind of the opposite of what everyone asks all the time around the fee. Um, but given some of the stuff you've outlined around media and, and maybe driving the, the SGNA down, you know, why do you need to increase the fee? Well, your sales are strong, your fee income growth is strong. So what, it, it, just because you've always done it doesn't mean you should do it. So, you know, what would be the rationale behind driving a fee increase at this point? You know, fee, fee increases go back to the members in lower prices. I mean that's that it, it creates. I mean, and that's that's a that's one of the key parts that we we use that that money for is that it allows us to broaden that that uh, distance from the competition and bring greater values and improving our operation overall for the member. So that that's uh, that's the primary focus. Okay, and then my next question actually is kind of dovetails on the last one, but you know. You guys talked about the consumer being a little bit better overall, um, and I guess what I was wondering, you know, is that really a Costco phenomenon? In other words, are you gaining share, um, and that's what's really driving your improvements in some of these categories, like electronics and appliances and big ticket, um, rather than the consumer actually getting better? Is there any way to tease that out? I would say that that's very fair. We our our merchants uh, report monthly on industry trends in the country and and or you know internationally as we're seeing and we can see our sales performance compared to the rest of market and i would think that you're spot on when you say that we're gaining market share scott maybe one thing i would just add too is i think you know we're all reading a lot about the the consumer of course and and what they're going through right now and um i think what we see is that value and quality has never been more important and so that plays to as ron described earlier what we deliver and we're making sure that the teams are laser focused on every day delivering that value and quality. And so I think we're drawing customers to what Costco's offered for many years, and it's, it's never more relevant than now based on what we're hearing from members and consumers. Yeah, we definitely like our Costco here at the uh, Mushkin residence. So thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank thanks, you, Scott. Scott. Your next question comes from the line of Edward Kelly with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Hi, Ron, I wanted to ask you about um, maybe, you know, membership fee increase, but in a different way. And you just touched upon it, um, you know, a little bit about, um, you know, membership fee increase, right, just gets reinvested um, to your members. But can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how you think about, um, you know, the areas of reinvestment? Um, I'm sure you probably have already done a lot of work around, like, where you would like that to go. Is there anything that's unique about where, um, you know, reinvestment might 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 come to this time this time around just thoughts around that 
you know, it, it, it's a, it moves as time moves and you see pricing in, in categories and um, where we have the greatest opportunity to be more competitive for our members. And it may be in an area that if fresh foods is seeing some price inflation, we may invest more in the fresh foods departments for that, that period of time. Um, you know, the, the nice part about our model with 36, 3700 SKUs is we're still quite nimble as big as we are. So we can shift and, and you know, based on the needs of our members and where we think the best investment in margin would uh, take care of them, we're able to, sh to shift that thing pro thought process and, and move it around. So I wouldn't say that there's any set, okay, if membership fee goes up, it's going to be spent in these areas. We work as a team and we continue to monitor it throughout the year and we act as, as, as needed. Okay, and just a quick follow-up on um, club throughput. Um, you know, it's remarkable how, you know, you drive up to a Costco club and it's hard to find a place to park, but yet you guys can still comp the way that you do. Um, how are you thinking about throughput, um, ways to improve that? And I don't know if both, you know, if Fireline Pickup is, is part of that. How do you think about things like scan and go, or maybe it's club density? Just curious as to how you solve for that over time. You know, the part, a good part of those is are things like our e-commerce business, and and uh, you know how we can how we can move out some of those goods out of the warehouse and and move that business online. And as Gary spoke to, now that we have control over Costco Logistics, we can bring great value to that experience as well. We continue to look at technology. Um, you know, we're we're testing some front door scanners that are going to start speeding up our registers um, significantly when we get all the Scanning and memberships are verified at the front door. It, it has shown a significant improvement in our register speed. And so that, in turn, turns over parking spaces much quicker. And so those kind of things, along with, you know, strategic infills to help open up parking opportunities and gas expansions where those are needed as well. So there are several different levers that we'll continue to pull on, on how we can, you know, best serve the member in that building and where we need to make sure that we can look at throughput. Great. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Your next question comes from the line of Oliver Chen with TD Cowan. Please go ahead. Hi, Ron and Gary. Um, you've done some really creative merchandising around UPTs and units per transaction with, uh, with pickup items and innovation on that treasure hunt. What are your thoughts there? Um, also, a big ticket and electronics, you know, previously, previously, it was a bit of a drag. Just would love your thoughts on on what you're seeing there. Uh, and third part is marketplace, the marketplace model and the concession model and alternative inventory uh, models. Just what are your views of opportunities there? Because they're, they're really big ones and your member is so loyal to you as well. Thank you. On, on your UPT, you were asking about the, the transaction impact? And thinking strategically about adding units to people's baskets um, going forward, um, and, and merchandising in that way as well, if it's a, if it's something you see in terms of an opportunity. Absolutely, we you know that's one of the big. Um, we were just in a, a session with our our grocery divisions and talking there, and we've seen a great success in international foods that have been brought in to the U.S. and and of the like from the U.S. into the other regions of the world where we do business. But you want to take care of not only the consumables in the grocery side, but when we bring in an item that's a success in Taiwan or Korea or the U.K., and it creates that excitement for the member, that's when we really have done a good job of triggering that impulsive purchase where members are trusting the buyers and they will add that additional item to their cart. So that, that's been a big win for us. Um, and, and again, it goes a lot of times with that treasure hunt. I mean, you know, you've heard the phrase, people come in to spend $100 and walk out with $300. Um, that's because our buyers do and our operators do a great job in, in making the warehouses exciting and keeping those, you know, on the forefront of what they're – when they come in to do their basic shopping, they pick up a few additional items that just compel them at the time. I think maybe just to add on that, Ron, too, I mean, the nice thing about the, the, the opportunity there for us is with – with uh, trips up by five percent, that that's really why the you know the average basket size has been more flat recently, and that's because we've been uh, growing member engagement in consumables, as as Ron mentioned, with food and and fresh. And so, 
it does present a great opportunity and it, I think it also speaks to the team doing a, a good job of driving more frequency of member visits. So it creates a great opportunity for us to drive more of that basket size as well. And then your question on marketplace is, is a significant opportunity for us moving forward. I mean, we really do indeed see that. I think especially with our limited SKU count in the warehouse, um, how can we expand the offering to a members, um, bring value to their membership card beyond what's within our four walls or what's on Costco.com? And uh, we see this as a great growth driver for us in the future and a way to bring expanded value to the members as we look forward. So I'm quite bullish on um, Costco Next and what that can become in the future. I think the difference for us on that um, would, would be, of course, as we are with Costco Next, is just being very curated for the members. So we're un unlike a traditional marketplace that w is about maybe just sheer volume for us, it's about making sure that the member's getting something that truly is unique and valuable and, and being consistent to who we are. And, but it's, there's tremendous upside opportunity there in that regard. Okay, and finally on that big ticket question, would love um, any green shoots on electronics or TV. Uh, and the last question on Asia, you have same day in China and you've done a, a lot of great things in the Asian region. Just would love any update there in terms of progress you made and, and the big opportunity for more infills as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think just briefly on electronics. So we believe, I think Ron, Ron referenced earlier, we look at a lot of the market data and we believe that we're, we're winning with the member there in terms of the value that we're delivering and, and when we look at our trends versus the market. So we feel good about uh, our ability to continue to uh, outpace the market there and we're seeing a good opportunity within digital in particular to really drive more connection with the member and take some of those big ticket items uh, from the warehouse to online as well. And, and in Asia, I think it, it would be consistent with what we've talked about with warehouses in the past that uh, we think uh, that all of the markets offer us a great opportunity for growth. Some of those markets in Asia are more mature, but there's still significant opportunities to open new warehouses and fill in those markets. And then obviously we have uh, markets like uh, China where we're really just sort of starting that journey, but there's tremendous growth opportunity as we identify the right the right path forward in that market. The, the grocery delivery in China, well, we're up and going in six buildings. We're at, we all just opened our seventh warehouse this week. Um, that will start up this weekend. Um, it's been a big win for our members. Uh, you know, it's delivery within two hours is what is able to be done. And so we're seeing some good incremental shops initially out of that program, and we look forward to good things in the future on that. Thank you. Best regards. Thank you. Thanks. Our final question comes from Joe Feldman with Tesla Advisory Group. Please go ahead. Great. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, a lot have been asked, but I, I did want to ask, with Costco Logistics, wh what was driving that 28% increase, which was very strong? I, I, was it, you know, new relationships with some of the other retailers or partnerships or just anything you could share on that would be helpful? Yeah, that that is other that is only they we only deliver Costco members orders through Costco Logistics. There are no partnerships going through those numbers that you see. Uh -huh. um, we we do a trace amount of Sears numbers, but that's not in any of the numbers that we report the growth in. That is just uh, part of the past relationship that's there as well. Um, and it is appliances, um, furnishings, and outdoor were the three big drivers. Appliances were, you know almost 30% growth for us in, in the period. Um, and again, to Gary's point, it's it's that member value of, of you know, the all-in, what you see is what you pay price for delivery, installation, haul away, everything you need done at one time that has really resonated with our members and uh, has been a great driver of sales for us. Joe, I'll give you the practical example. As a, a new entrant to the Seattle market, I just had uh, Costco Logistics deliver two mattresses, three TVs, and uh, and a couple of chairs as well for me. So that's the kind of stuff I think that we're seeing really resonate with members. Got it. That's great. That's great. Thanks, guys. And then um, just one one other question. I know it, it's it's still relatively small, I think, but the Costco Next, you know, is that – sort of it seems like it's ramping nicely I guess how will that continue to ramp in the future like where do you see that going and and you know how important is, is that a driver like is that sort of the basis for this marketplace that Oliver was just asking about you know as Gary mentioned earlier Costco next is a bit unique but is it a fully curated marketplace as, as there's many other marketplaces out there that are just for somebody to go on and sell 
sell goods on uh, on this marketplace. These are relationships that our buyers have with our suppliers, and we're creating new suppliers as well. Um, this has not only been a new way to sell goods, we've also found that we can find some really neat items that are selling through Costco Next that we in turn then bring into our warehouse. So it, it is a great testing ground for newness, uh, new items, a way to expand categories of accessories for certain categories that, you know, you have swing sets that we sell online, but you have additional swings and slides and other activities that you sell that we normally wouldn't be able to fit into a warehouse. So it, it really complements um, the core warehouse business, but gives us an opportunity to expand member value to these other partners as well. So we see a lot of upside there. Got it. That's great. Thanks, guys. Good luck with the fourth quarter. Thank, Thank you. you. We have no further questions in our queue. And with that, this does conclude today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. And